to share something, um, you know, uh, by virtue of uh, being uh, you know, a pastor here, I traveled quite a bit in the last six months. I've traveled almost, uh, you know, half of the world. And every time I go, uh, there's one question they constantly ask me, what kind of a church your church is? Have anybody asked you the question? You know, when you say you're going to church, okay, tell me, um, what is your church? Or uh, what kind of a church you are from? Are you go to Methodist church, or you go to Baptist, or an Anglican, or you are a Pentecostal, or an Evangelical church, or you, you know, how many people are there, how big is your church, or, you know, the questions, right? They always ask you. The moment you say you are going to church, okay, what kind of a church? Has anyone asked you that do the church, in your church, people love you? How good you are in loving each other? Has anybody asked you that question? I have, you know, there are scores of people have asked me about the church, what kind of a church I hold, or what kind of a, a denomination or believe in. But I haven't come across even one person asked me that in your church, do people love one another? Is your church is a loving church? Why? Because when Jesus uh, said, I will build my church, turn to Matthew chapter 16. Let's look at a few verses today. I'm glad you brought your Bible. Matthew 16. You know, Jesus asked him, who do the people say who I am? And then Simon says in 16, 16, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Well done, Peter. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Okay, you got it right. This is not you have got this understanding. This is God has given you this understanding that, you know, I have come from God. And then he says, and I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. What Jesus is saying, the revelation what you mentioned just now, that I am the Christ, on this I am going to build my church. Because, you know, people think, you know, Peter means... Oh, this is Peter is going to be the head of the church. You know, if you down the line, you read verse 23, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You know, it's not a Peter. It's on the revelation of who Jesus is. So Jesus is saying, I will build my church. It's not we are building our church. No. It is Jesus is building a church. So first of all, what kind of a church we are? Is it about the building or is it about the denomination or is it the Pentecostal or we believe in healing or we believe in that? It's, it's what kind of an identity we should be having it. Because here it says, I will build my church and then look at verse 19 and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whoever, whatever you lose on the earth it will be loosed in heaven. Yeah, verse 18 it says, I will build my church and the gates of hate, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So there is a church that Jesus is building in the church that none of the enemy can prevail against it. In our church, that Jesus is building our church, there cannot be any of the enemy attack that the enemy can prevail against us. So no enemy can prevail against us. It's not about the building. You know, this building is going to be sold, so soon we may be looking, going into some other places. So it's not about the building, it's about the believers together becoming the body of Christ is what the church is. For which Christ is the head and we are all part of one of the body. So that is what church is. So Jesus is being the head. So he is heading the church and we are all being part of the body is what called church. It's not the physical building. God does not live here. 
in the first Corinthians it says in chapter 3 verse 16 says you are the temple of the living God so it becomes you become the temple of the God it is not the building it's not that you know earlier in the Old Testament people will love to come they have to come really scared to come to the presence of God because only the priest can go the high priest can go into the presence of God once a year only but whereas here today we can come to God and whatever with the problems, whatever the difficulty, we can just come to God and we can worship, we can enjoy His goodness, enjoy His presence. So what here you see is, it is that Jesus is saying, I will build my church. And only thing he says is in Matthew 22, you know this is the, one of the person comes and asks him, uh, teacher, he wanted to test Jesus, he is asking, verse 36, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. You should remember that 2000 years before when Jesus came in to um, uh, preach the gospel and they were following the Moses commandment of 10 commandments and then they had the 5 commandments by over 613 commandments that's what they were following so here Jesus is saying okay now you forget about all this thing there's one commandment that's a great commandment that is you got to love your God with all your heart with all your mind with all your strength and then the second this is the first and the great commandment and the second is like it you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The second one, one is first you love God and the second one is love your neighbor. It doesn't say love your spouse or love your person whom you love. You know in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus uh, talks about love he says okay it is okay to love a person who loves you. Even the tax collectors do. So what is the problem? There's no nothing in it. But I tell you, you love your enemies. How can we love our enemies? We find it so difficult to love a person who offended you, who said something against you. It's very difficult for you to love somebody who's not thinking the same way, who's not you know doing anything um, against you. you. It's very difficult for you to love. But Jesus says you love. And then look at verse 40, it says, On these two commandments hanging all the law and the prophets. So everything, whatever the Old Testament, it talks about it, it's all hanging in only two commandments. One is, you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, and then love your neighbor like yourself. Is there anybody who do, doesn't love yourself? then we need to pray for you. <laughs> you know, we all take time to make sure that we look good, we uh, look after ourselves and we eat. You know, if you don't love yourself, you don't eat. So we take care of ourselves. Same way, you should love your neighbor. Anybody who is sitting next to you or anyone in this church is a neighbor, anyone who see outside, anybody is a neighbor. You can love anybody and everybody. But how it is possible? You need to receive the love of God in your heart so that you will be able to love somebody else. <coughs> you know, it says, Jesus says, all the law and the prophets, everything is hanging on this truth. That these two, you make it right, it is fine. You know, we are so good at reading uh, Deuteronomy 28. Remember? Yeah, turn with me. Deuteronomy 28. I'll just read a couple of verses on that. Deuteronomy 28 verse 1 Now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. So and then the next 14 verses talks about the blessing. Mm. If you obey his voice, huh? it's a conditional blessing. If you obey his voice, you diligently hear his voice and obey, then these are the promises. 
verse 15 you see. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord. Then next, 54 verses is a curses. If you don't obey, these are the curses. If you obey, these are the blessings. But what Jesus said in John 14 verse 15, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. You know, what God, Jesus is turning it is, earlier you were doing it just to get away from God. You were just doing it to get away from God so that you can be in, within the boundaries, you can be blessed. But here what Jesus is saying, no, no, no. You will keep up my commandments. You will obey my commandments. Why? Because of love. If you do not have the love, you cannot serve God. If you, if you do not have love, I'm telling you, any of you here, or you come to this church, or you've been part of the church, if you do not have love, then all whatever you do, everything is zero, big zero. No use. We, we see in Isaiah 58 about fasting. You don't have to turn. You can go back and study. They were doing the fasting. They were doing the right thing for a wrong reason. Their hearts were not in it. In the old covenant, you can do something and you can still be right. Let me give you one example. Do not commit adultery. Okay? In the old covenant, I don't have to commit adultery and I also don't have to love my wife, still I am fine with God. Are you getting this? In the old covenant, only thing is I should not commit adultery, but there is no commandment for me to love my wife. Nothing. I am fine. As far as God is concerned, I don't love my wife, I also don't commit adultery, I am fine. But in the new covenant, it is not like that. It's not only I don't have to commit adultery, even I should not look at a woman in that way. Job, you know, we read some time back, Job says, you know, I made a covenant with my eyes that I will not look at a woman lustfully. In the message translation it says, I will not undress a woman with my eyes. So, the new covenant is very, very high. Look at Romans chapter 13. It's verse 8, it says, Oh, no one, anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. If you want to fulfill the law, if you want to, you know, live according to the commandments or anything according to God's law, then you need to love. Verse 9, it says, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, and if there is any other commandments, they are all summed up in the saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then it says, love does no harm to neighbor, therefore, love is the fulfillment of love. So, when we come to God, when we come here, that how do we know that we love God? It is only by loving others. You know, come to John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. Okay. John 13, verse 34 and 35. A new commandment I give it to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus is saying, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. How did Jesus love you? He died for your sins. Mm -hmm. Nobody will come and die for you. No, none. But Jesus came and he died for you. He loved, he loved you. He demonstrated his love because in Romans 5.8 it says why he demonstrated his love to us while we were still sinners, Christ died for you. So here it says, 
a new commandment I give it to you that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another very simple if we want to see that you are you love God it will be known by how much you love one another It's not a big thing. Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you love one another. I will love only that person. That sister smiles at me and she always speaks to me, so I will love that sister. That brother, no. I don't like him, so I won't. Where do we get our doctrines? Where do we get our theology like this? No, the day I called up, she didn't even look at me or the day I came, the pastor didn't even look at me or the pastor didn't speak to me or that one didn't speak to me. So I, I'm not going to speak or I'm not going to do something. It says, you will be known you are my disciples only by you loving one another. It's so difficult for us, you know, because it's so self-centered. Our world has become so self-centered. We are so much worked up, we are so much worried about ourselves. Now that's all. I want this one, I want a big car, I want a big house, I want a big business, I want a big job, I want a big money, I want a big... You know, there is no end to it. If you are going to look at yourself, what you will have? You can have three bedrooms, you can have ten bedrooms, you can have fifteen bedrooms, but you are going to sleep in only one bed. <laughs> you can have ten cars, but you are going to go in only one car. It's, you know, there is no end to it. If you are really look at it, there is no end to it. If you are going to, if you are going to be, who is your God? If you put yourself as God, then your, all your desires, all your time, you will try to do, please yourself, not please God. Because the focus will shift, you know, because you got to love one another. It's very difficult to love somebody who doesn't love you. Can you love someone who doesn't love you? That's what God is asking, expecting. You know, when you walk into this church, there should be such a love in this place. People will love to tell, you know, our church, when people come, oh, you go to WCF, such a love, I tell you. That's what people will love to say. Nothing else. It's not about moving mountains, people getting healed, delivered. That and all, it's nonsense. That is, you know, not big thing. If you love one another, if you see the love of God in our midst, that, oh, I walk into that church, I talk to people, they are full of love. They want to encourage me, they want to do something, they want to help me, they want me to eat, they want me to do things. They are such a lovely people, they are such a love in this year. Then people will know that you are Jesus' disciple. Not by speaking in tongues, not by singing and dancing. No, that you can do without love. You know, Paul writes to Corinthian church, one of the worst church. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about all the gifts. What are the gifts and how the gifts works, how the, the body and everything. And then in the chapter 14, he talks about how to operate on those gifts. And in between is chapter 13. You know, we put the chapters only in 15th century. Paul did not write a chapter and verses. And we take that chapter only for wedding. Paul did not write a chapter for wedding, please. <laughs> that is, what are the gifts and how you are going to operate and how you are going to operate in love. That's what very important. You know, you can deliver people, you can heal people, God's spirit can work through you. But if you are doing it for money, if you are doing it for ulterior motive, then you are wrong. It's absolutely wrong. You know, uh, in 1st John, I'll read it from 1st John chapter 4. Verse 11. I'll read it from the New Living Translation. Don't speak evil against each other, my dear brothers. No, that's James. I'll read from 1st John.
Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. God has loved us, so we ought to love each other. If you have come to this church for some time, you must be knowing. We know John 3.16. For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, so that whoever <coughs> believes in Him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. What is 1 John 3.16? Come on, you should be, by now you should be saying it by heart. Yeah, we should love one another. We should lay down our life for one another. How Christ has died for us. Same way, we should die. We, we should be even willing to die for one another. That's what the love is all about. Let me read the first John. We are in first John. Let me read the first few verses in chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is the child of God. Okay, you are the children of God. You are the child of God. And everyone who knows the father loves his children. If you know God, you should love his children. Everyone who believes that Jesus is God, he is the children of God. And if you know God, then you should love his children. That we are all brothers and sisters. So we should love each other. We should look at, you know, how we can look at God, how God looks at it. Same way we should look at it and we should love. You know, love warrants you to do something. It's not just saying empty words, I love you. If you say love, if you love a person, won't you think that you will do something? You will. Naturally, you will do. It says, you know, and everyone who loves the father loves his children too. We know we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. If you love God, if you obey his commandments, you will love one another. Look at verse 3. Loving God means keeping his commandments and really that isn't difficult. We, you know, it's, we make it so, so simple. God, I love you, but I can't love my husband. God, I love you. I can't love my wife. God, I love you. But I can't love that brother. I can't love that. I can't stand against that person. But God, I love you. Please go back and read these scriptures. It's very clear. Loving God means keeping his commandments and really that isn't difficult. For every child of God defeats this evil world by trusting Christ to give the victory and the one who is win the win this battle against the world are the ones who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So it's very important, very clear that we have to love one another and we need to be in love. Then only we will be known by others that you are his disciple. So if you want to be a believer, you can come into the church, you can sit, you can live your life the same way, you can die as a believer. But if you want to be a disciple, you got to love one another. Loving only, no, it's not so difficult. God is not asking you to do something else. No, accept the differences. Accept the difference. But the thing is, we need to experience the love from God. Then only we can love somebody else. Today, the love becomes such a rare commodity. Either in Christendom or outside Christendom. The divorce is happening all over. The problems are happening all over. We are not able to experience that love. We need to love God and we need to do it. When we love God, we experience that love in our heart, so we will be able to love one another. I don't know why, you know, there are churches, we have got so many churches, there are mega churches, there are so many, you know, there are millions and millions of people have gathered today in all over the world to worship God, but they are not able to love one another. But Jesus very clearly said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. 
and loving one another. You know, Jesus wrote a letter, the last seven churches, uh, come to Revelation chapter 2. He writes to the church in Ephesus. Okay. You know, don't think um, everybody will be perfect so you can love. When I come to church, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord sister, praise the Lord brother, so I can love. They will be very um, nice and comfort. You know, when Jesus chose 12 disciples, you know, there was a very big controversy among the people, the, the, those the disciples. You know, the Simon the Zealot or the Canaanite in your Bible, some of the translation calls it a Simon the Canaanite or Simon the Zealot. There is Simon Peter, this is another Simon. The Simon Zealot is a guy who believed that we can bring the Jewish kingdom by only by war. So he was kind of a, a terrorist kind of a person. He wanted to, you know, take, uh, set up a military a kind of an army so that he can defeat the Romans and he can take over Jewish kingdom. That's a kind of an attitude person. The other end is a tax collector. Do you think it's easy for them to sit together in one place? All the twelve of them? The guy, Matthew is working for Romans and he is collecting tax and he is paying to Roman and he is living his life. Whereas the other guy who is sitting here, he wants to kill the Romans to bring the kingdom. And they have to sit together and they have to eat together and Jesus has to be sitting together. Do you think it's easy? That's why Jesus said you love one another. Simon? Matthew? Imagine. It's, it's, we don't have to go look at, you know, 5,000 people, 10,000 people church. <laughs> Jesus had only 12 people church. In that 12 people church, two people had big issue. So we will have issue. But you have to, beyond that, you have to love one another. You, you have to look at them, how God looks at them, and then you need to love them. Look at this. Um, Jesus writes to the church in Ephesus, okay? In uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work. You look at the church hallmark, okay? You look at the credentials of the church. Jesus, you know, the, this is the same church. We have got the book. But the Ephesians book, which Paul wrote, the one of the wonderful spiritual book, talks about all the uh, secrets and the inner being of a spiritual gift, how a wonderful, awesome book is Ephesus. And almost about close to two and a half years, Peter stayed, Paul stayed in the church and he established the church and they are wonderful people, um, very spiritual church compared to Corinth. So Ephesians is a wonderful church because um, Ephesians, uh, they were worshipping the goddess of Diana. The great, the goddess of Diana. You, you can go back and read in Acts chapter 19. Uh, that's where you will find the entire history about uh, the church in Ephesus. And um, all these uh, silversmiths and everybody, they were making the statue of Diana and they were selling, they were making money out of that. And then they war against uh, Paul and then they were uh, trying to get rid of him and it was a big commotion, there was a riots in uh, Ephesus. And you should know one thing, the Eph Ephesians the, in Ephesus, they had one of the largest library in those days. They had over 100,000 books in Ephesus library in those days, 2000 years before. Imagine such a big library, all the other things. And it's all talks about the goddess and the, all the other things. When they came to know that Jesus is the true living God, they burnt everything. It's like millions and millions of dollars worth. They burnt everything and they said, Jesus is the God, we want only Jesus. That's why the book is talking about so much about Ephesus, about the spiritual gifts and everything. So major revival. So here Jesus is writing, the first letter he is writing, after his resurrection he is writing. The first letter is to Ephesus. And it says, first one. I know all things you do. I have seen your hard work. This church is really working hard. Whatever the things that God set out for them, they are really working hard. They were doing all their evangelism. They were doing all the, you know, feeding the poor. All the programs they were doing. 
they were really working hard. It's a hard working church. And second, your, and your patient endurance. They've been persecuted. But with all the problem, they were somehow, they were patiently, somehow God will do it. They were patiently enduring. It's a wonderful thing. And look at that. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. So they had the spiritual discernment. They had the spiritual <coughs> gifts. They know the scriptures. So when the false prophet or the false apostles comes, they teach about something false. They know, no, 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 this is not right. This is not according to the scriptures. So they know the scriptures. Right? They were hard working. They were really working hard. Second is they were enduring whatever the problem, whatever the pain, they were enduring. Absolutely, they were going through all the difficulty, but patiently they were enduring. And then thirdly, they were operating on the gifts of the spirit. They know the scriptures. So they were able to identify who is a false apostle and they were able to expose them and they won't tolerate them. What a wonderful church. And then look at the next one. You know, you have patiently suffered for me without quitting. They are suffering for the sake of gospel, for the sake of God. Isn't it wonderful? You know, how many of you want to join a church like that? It's so good. Right? They are hard working. And they are per per patiently enduring. And they were really, you know, know the scriptures. They were operating on the gifts of the spirit. And they are working hard. And now they, we, we see not only that, they patiently suffered without quitting. But, but, I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did as first. You can be hard working. You know the scriptures. You may be operating on all the gifts of the spirit. All the nine gifts. You may be operating on them. You may be knowing all the scriptures. You may be able to identify the false apostles. You are able to, you may be going through the suffering. You may be without quitting. You may be doing all these things. But, if you do not lost the first love, then it is useless. It's such a good church. You know, when outside, if you look at a church like this, you will go, wow, I want to be part of that church. You know, that anointing, you know how, you know, so many programs is happening. They got a women's ministry, they got children's ministry, they got a poor, they got orphanage ministry, they got every ministry. Oh, the government is persecuted them, but they are going on what hard work, you know, daily activities happening. Um, the Tuesday Bible study, Wednesday Bible study, Thursday Bible study, everything is going. They know the scriptures. Oh, by heart, they will tell you the scriptures. They, anybody who tells a false one, they will be able to identify. They are really, really all out for God. But, they don't have a love for God. They have love. They love God, but not first. You love God, but not first. You lost your first love. That's what New King James Version says. You lost your first love. When I don't have anything, then I will come to church. When I don't have anything to do, then I will come for evangelism. When I don't have anything, then let me look at coming to the church. Or you put something else first and God gets the later, 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 later. It's a very big rebuke what Jesus had given to that. If you, love, if, if you don't have love, I'm so sorry to say, that's not going to yield any results. It's not, it's, you know, there's no point in knowing scriptures, operating on the gifts, you can do everything. If you do not have the love of God and you don't, you know, love others, each other, and you don't love God and you don't give God as a number one priority, you don't have the first love for God, then it is a waste. 
God says no. Turn back to me again. Work as you did first. If you don't, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. He says, I will remove my presence from you. What a, what a harsh rebuke. You look at it. If you do not operate on love, you may run the schemes, the all the you know God-given sponsored program, everything will be going very well. But if you do not have the love, his presence will not be there. Maybe miracles will happen, maybe the other things will happen, maybe you will have a, a wonderful worship, a band and music and everything. But if you do not have the love for God, the first love for God, God says, I will remove my presence, I will remove the lampstand from you. You know, the first love, if you do not have the first love, then you are bound to have a lot of difficulty. Let me finish with this. Come to third chapter. This is the last letter uh, Jesus wrote to the uh, Laodicean church. Um, chapter 3, verse uh, 14 onwards. But let me read, um, yeah, let me read uh, verse 15. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. Today this is the problem in our Christian love. They are neither cold nor hot and they will be always be like that. We will always come to church, we will hear the message, we will go back the same way we came. Our lives doesn't change. There is got to be a radical change. I was speaking in a, uh, a fellowship on Saturday and near Winslow. And one of the guy who had a um, had lot of problem, he is from a Muslim faith and he got healed and uh, completely delivered and he has become a Christian and he was so joyful, he was sharing his testimony and everything and uh, we were having a breakfast meeting, after the breakfast I went to the toilet and came back and this guy didn't even waste any time, he witnessed about Jesus to the reception lady and he was talking to her about God and he was giving a leaflet to her. But all the other 40 Christians, they were came, they went back the same day. I don't know why, you know, just because we know the scripture, just because we know the story, just because we know Bible, we don't take that radical response what God is expecting from us. Jesus says, either you be cold or you hot. Either be here or that side. You know, it's always two paradigm in the uh, in the Garden of Eden. Maybe next time I will share that message. You see, the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. And you see Babylon, you see Jerusalem. It's always, Elijah said, either you serve Baal or you serve the living God. Jesus said, either you serve God or you serve money. It's right. Yep. Always there are two choices. Either you serve the living God or the Baal. Or you serve God or money. Are you serve Babylon or you serve God? Jerusalem. You know, interestingly, in Revelation 17, it talks about the Babylon as great Babylon. The great Babylon. It's not a normal Babylon. Great. The great Babylon. It's not about numbers. Please understand this. It's not about how big, how great it is. The great Babylon, the mother of the harlots. <coughs> Whereas in Revelation 19, it calls Jerusalem the holy city. It's not a great city. Jerusalem is a holy city. Jesus said, the path is narrow. Few will find it. What's harlot? Or what's a prostitution? You know, the spiritual prostitution is nothing but you are married to God, but you will now and then you will look at that thing or you will uh, do some kind of a sin. You will do, do that one or this one and then you will come back to God. That's what spiritual adultery. You are married, but still sometime you go with the other woman, you will look at this one, you will do that one. But that's, that's what adultery is. Spiritual adultery is you are married to God, but yet you will serve sometime your pleasures, sometime I want to do that one, sometime I will do this one, that one, and then I will come to God. That's what the spiritual adultery. And here it says, verse 16, 
so that because you are lukewarm and neither cold or not hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. It's a very stock word. But the good news is he loves you and he wants all of your attention. He's a loving God who came, who died for you. And he wants your full attention. He wants your first love. He wants your first love. He can, he, he can deliver you, he can set you free, he can bless you, he can give you whatever you want. But as a church, as an individual, you need to put back your first love to God. Even as a church, as a corporate church, as we all together, we have to put back our first love to God. Anything and everything we do here, we do it because of the love of God. The love of God compels us. That's what Paul writes. So we need to do only out of the love of God, not for anything else. And as a personal life, I would like you to check yourself how far you are a Jesus disciple. Are you able to love the one who is hating you? Are you are able to love the one who loves you? As a church, this is the great challenge which we need to take. When someone comes to our church, they should be able to tell us, I came to your church, I saw just such a love that I have never witnessed anywhere. That's, that's what the hallmark of God's church. People will have to come and tell us, wow, you guys are disciples of Jesus because such a love. I was felt so warm in here when I came. You guys all came. You loved me. You guys served me and you looked after me. You guys made me at home. I'm so happy that I came to your church. I could see the love of God. That's what Jesus, that's a yardstick Jesus gave. That you will be known, my disciples, by you love one another. I pray and I request you, each one of you, that you will perfect in his love. In a Romans 13, 8 says, Oh, anyone except the debt of love. So what he says, let us be debtor in love. Let's love one another. Let's cherish one another. It, it, it may not be easy. Please understand that. You know, even in your own hands, there are five fingers. They are all different. They are all different. But they all come together, then only there is a job can be done. If they are all going to be, you know, each finger is going to be stiff like this. No, I won't work with that guy. I won't work with this little finger. I won't work with the thumb finger. Can I carry a glass? No, 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 no. I won't cooperate. If they, you know, if they are, both of them are fighting, how will I be able to carry a glass? I won't be able to. But they work together. They are so different. Each finger is so different. They work together. You are all, you look at each other, you are all different. You are all very different. But we all need to work together in love. Not for any other reason. Because Jesus said, I love you. I have loved you the same way God has loved us. So I pray that you will experience that heavenly love. And you will be able to love one another. And we as a church, as a body of Christ, we will be perfected in love. That people will come and see the love of God in us. And they will say, wow, they are the Christians. They are the disciples of Jesus Christ. They can love. Let's pray.